Welcome everybody to another episode of Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's Medical Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Todorovic. I'm joined, as always, by my dopey co-host, Dr. Matt Barton. How are you, Matt? Great to be here. Wonderful. Uh, special guest today, Matt. Uh, he is special. He is special. He's a, he's a friend of ours and a friend of the podcast. It is Dr. Sandy Macquarie. Now, Sandy is a special human being. He is a paramedic with 30 years experience, he's a researcher, he's an educator, uh, he's basically done it all Matt, I mean he's been a paramedic on the ocean, he's been a paramedic in the air, he's now also a paramedic for movies and TV shows uh, and as an educator he knows what it basically takes to be a paramedic. And that's what we're going to go through today. Sandy, welcome to the podcast. Gosh, it's really, really good to be here. I've been begging these two to be on for, oh, let's, let's say years. Say years. Well, we've been begging you, to be honest. And finally, we've been able to get together yeah. and do it. Now, Sandy, I want to begin by just wanting to ask you to be able to sort of tell us very briefly about yourself right now. What, what do you do Right now. A day, in the, a day in the life of Sandy. Yeah. Yeah. So my main hangout is at Griffith University. I'm a senior lecturer. Hey, that's where we are. I know. I wish I knew He's that. at my campus though, not yours. Oh, yeah, that's right. Gold Coast. I hang out at the paramedicine program. I'm a senior lecturer and researcher. I've been there four years. Very small, very high quality program. So I'm doing some lecturing to the second and third year students and I'm doing research. Uh, and kind of all the other normal stuff that comes with being in academia. What's your research broadly? Uh, health, wellness, well-being, constructs of fatigue, exploring resilience, uh, what what makes providers tick, and how do we keep them healthy. And you've also got your own consulting business, right? Uh, on the side, yes, I do a little bit of work on that, and we'll see what that takes us in the so future. So what's that called? What's the business? Uh, it's called the Edge Human Performance Group. Beautiful. So... People can hire you if they want. Uh, as I suspect, yes. <laughs> Are you charging for today? Uh, well, God, I hope not. We I'm don't earn anything. The, I'm holding up the payment, which, <laughs> which is the mug. How's that? That's Beautiful. pretty fair. All right. So, uh, we and, one, and one of your endeavors is where we met, the three of us. It is. On a, so on a, a film, a film studio. Well, that's what I was going to say. So uh, Matt and I both met Sandy. Uh, even though we all worked at the university for a number of years together, obviously universities are big places, uh, we met Sandy because uh, Matt and I were engaged to do a TV show with Chris Hemsworth uh, called Limitless, which the listener may have seen or heard on the Disney Channel. Chris Hemsworth goes through all these... Stress, fi- stressful... Well, scenarios. all these physiological yeah, activities, uh, basically trying to make him a better person, whatever that may mean, mentally and physically. And the first episode is on stress. And we heard that Sandy does He's research. He's the best person. Yes. And they're like, you want to get like this. It, this is the epitome of a human being. Well, that's right. <laughs> it's, so we, we needed to find the perfect human. To do this, and we found Sandy because he does research using uh, a wearable device mm-hmm. called Hexoskin. Tell us very briefly about the Hexoskin and how we used it. With we had a great time <coughs> filming that Hemsworth documentary with you. Uh, hence, why this uh, romance that we've begun, and I should probably say relationship, uh, but fair. it's 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 a romance, uh, <laughs> a bromance, bromance. maybe. Uh, Tell us about what the Hexaskin is, what it does, how you utilize it, and then we can jump into you as a paramedic because I want to go through your life story. Fair. We'll jump back 30 years, but answer this question first. Fair yeah. enough. Go. Well, I undertook a PhD and started in 2014. I wanted to understand how paramedics were stressed in their job, so I, I came across this product. Is it a stressful job? <laughs> it's very stressful. <laughs> it is very stressful, and that's, that's not neither a good nor a bad thing. It's just what it is. Yeah. The Hexoskin allowed me back way back when, almost 10 years ago, to monitor paramedics as they worked, went on jobs, went on call, we're in the crew room, we're resting. And uh, I got quite, quite good at using them, and this is a product out of uh, Montreal, Quebec, and uh, I was one of the first to use them. So I got really good at, at using them to monitor physiolo- phys- physiology. They came up with a kind of a, a Gen 2, which they call the AstroSkin. 
and currently used on the International Space Station and other places. So I was an early adopter. And it was those that were sitting in my drawer when you came calling yeah. on that day to say, hey, would you like to meet someone? We can't tell you who. <laughs> on a television show, we can't tell you the name. <laughs> and we can't tell you the major city you're going to. Yeah, and that's it was how good we, though. And that's how we met. And that hexaskin <laughs> can measure, it measures respiratory rate. It's got a three lead ECG. It's got, um, what, what else can it do? It can do a whole bunch. Yeah, it's a triaxial, triaxial accelerometer. And it'll sum them to uh, give G-force. It'll calculate tidal volume, minute ventilation, all sorts of kind of mins and maxes of the respiratory rate and the heart rate, and of course the tracing lead too. But also you can, you can drill in and it'll do heart rate variability analysis. Yes. It'll, blood pressure? Uh, the astro skins will do blood pressure. Uh, what we call SpO2 or the amount of blood, oxygen the kind of oxygen dissolved in your blood and skin temp. Perfect. Yeah. It's cool. It does a lot of stuff. That's and cool. I've started to jump into this <coughs> work as well. Literally, and Sandy has been my mentor. Yeah. So let's now talk about Sandy as the paramedic. 30 years. Let's go back 30 years. Where were you? Were you even born 30 years ago? Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah. Matt was 30. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to know. So firstly, uh, like you said, being a paramedic 30 years, uh, what made you, what were you doing before that? What made you get into paramedicine and what was it like getting into paramedicine 30 years ago? Yeah, And this is in Canada, right? It's in Canada. Saskatchewan. So, well, no, let's go east. So we'll go as far as Nova Scotia. We're going to get on a boat and keep going wow. until we hit an island called Prince Edward Island. Is this where, um, that's where I'm from? And really? Anne of Green Gables is from? Anne of Green Gables. So you were her paramedic? That's what, we, that's what we're known for, and that's it. Wow. Yeah. Well, now they're known for Anne of Green Gables and having Sandy Macquarie. Yeah, they, they're not really playing up the second part <laughs> <laughs> in their tourism <laughs> campaign. Let's say I uh, grew up on a farm and kind of had this strong leaning towards like taking over the family farm or having your own farm. What type of farm? Uh, at the, that I grew up on was... Donkey beef, farm? Beef and sheep. Beef and sheep? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you do things differently in Australia. Hybrid, but hybridized. <laughs> and sheep. So I actually went to uni and I got a degree in agriculture. Oh. Yeah, I graduated in 1986 and kind of went back and bought a farm and got married and started to have kids and we were farming and was working for the Department of Agriculture. But, but my life took one of these, you know, fortuitous turns when I joined a rural fire department because uh, we lived in the country and I wanted something oh. else to do. There was four paramedics in that fire department. Wow. We were... At high speed, we were at least a half an hour from the closest ambulance. We had a stretch of highway that we looked after, plus all the, obviously the, the residents and their homes. But we would we would go to car incidents, accidents, crashes, and I would watch them work, and I was enthralled with right. how they worked and the care that they gave. And at that time, I was you know reasonably satisfied. But I thought in, in my work, but I thought, wow, is this ever cool? Uh, the second stroke of luck is that if you wanted to be at that time, that's, it's called an emergency medical technician level one. You could go to a local community college. As luck would have it in the, you know, in the maritime provinces, I lived almost beside the one. So I changed course and talked my wife into letting me go back to school. And right. that, uh, it was the, the, the classroom portion was three months long. And he did two months of what we called on-the-job training. And then you graduate, and the next day you're running calls. And what, what were you qualified as then? At that time, well, the, the diploma said emergency medical technician level one. Yep. But on my license, it, it said, uh, my very first license said ambulance attendant. Right. And at that time, there was three versions, ambulance attendant, ambulance driver, yes, ambulance driver, and the highest level, ambulance driver attendant. Right. Yeah. And you're an EMT. Yeah, so we, we would call ourselves EMTs. We were known as, well, literally in those days, um, people called us any number of things, but the word, par <laughs> the word paramedic, the term paramedic was years away. Oh, really? Years and years away. It was, wasn't even thought of at that time in terms of where we were. So we settled in. I knew as soon as I finished the course that I didn't want to go back to my job with the Department of Agriculture. Right. I knew that I wanted to be a paramedic. Well, at that time, an EMT. And I knew that I just wanted to do different things than they had been doing. So, that so was how old were you at that time? I was 28. Wow. Yeah. And was that difficult f as a family unit to get a job in that space, pay-wise, pay wise, things like that? Yeah, it did because uh, historically at that time on Prince Edward Island, the ambulance services were private. So they were, f they were owned by individuals, literally. Right. Their genesis in some instances was literally from, from funeral homes. 
So a funeral homes would have, uh, they'd have an ambulance attached to them. And if they needed to go run a, an emergency calls, they would, they could. And eventually people just bought the licenses and made them ambulance services. So there was, there was a couple of big ones. My first uh, job was with Royal Ambulance Service in Summerside, Prince Edward Island, where I'd done my on-the-job training and uh, was owned by a gentleman. And <clears throat> we did any number of different kinds of shifts, but the shift length at that time ranged from you could do a day shift or up to 63 hours straight. <laughs> and, and then <laughs> what? Because you're so on call. Right? Yeah, you, lived, you, you essentially lived in what might be considered a house. Right. And uh, there'd be a frontline crew and, a, and, a, and another crew, and then... They would call in casual crew to do what we call off-island trips. So if you had to have really definitive care, they'd move you to another province to to a bigger hospital. And so you said you had, what was this, four months of training? Three months three months in the classroom and two months of on-the-job training where you shadowed the, the crew. So thinking back on that five months of learning, education, uh, knowing what you know now, the breadth of your knowledge, do you look back and go, oof, that was... You know, was it a trial by fire where you actually learned a lot in that time period? Or do you think back and go, oh, my God, I was so unqualified at that time to do that job. H- how do you sit back and look at it through uh, through the eyes of uh, reflection? Oh, I was a potato. <laughs> <laughs> I had a preceptor one time look at me and he said, yeah, Sandy, you're a potato. You don't know what you don't know. So I was... That's uh, the problem, though, isn't it? The well, unknown unknowns, right? But it, was, it, it carried me because I didn't know what I didn't know. Uh, at that time, 30 years ago, the interventions that we could do were limited. Mm. So when you think of today's scope of paramedicine, paramedic, I should say, and you look at shows like Ambulance Australia and all the drugs and the monitors and the equipment that they have, we didn't have them. Right. So we had, an, we had, we had obviously the stretcher and we had high-speed transport. We had uh, oxygen. We, had, we were just beginning to get symptom relief medication. Would that have been different if you worked in the urban setting, though? Urban settings in... Eastern Canada were more advanced than that. They were, yeah. So the big cities like we call Halifax, Nova Scotia, St. John, New Brunswick. But in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, it was, it was very rudimentary, but it was really good good and caring people. And, you know, the, the people that I worked with there at that, that time, some of whom are still working really? there. On the doing, island? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, and doing well, like people that I, that I trained with and trained me, um, you, you, what we couldn't uh, learn in in um, college is is the empathy, kindness, and caring that is, is part and parcel to being a, a paramedic. Mm. So, and that, it's true even to today. Like you know, we educate paramedics in the university here. Amazing, amazing kind of three year degree, but uh, we rely on them bringing life skills in with them, and and hopefully that the preceptors and mentors can ingrain in them. I don't know, intrinsically, vicariously, the, uh, watch how I treat this person and, and, and go back and forth with this patient. Yeah. So do you think you <coughs> were trained well enough in the theory for the psychological aspect of it or did you lo- learn that on the hands-on and working with your colleagues? No, we weren't, we weren't really prepared and I don't think that there was ever a, a kind of a concerted effort to say, you know, if you start to unpack what we know now in terms of the literature of being a paramedic and the, and the kind of the toll that it takes, because it does, um, that wasn't touched on. And there was almost a, I, I'm not going to say a, a shelf life to EMTs or ambulance attendants or drivers at that time, but it certainly wasn't an investment in, you know, you're going to sign on and you're going to do the next 30 years with us. Like if you wow. sign on with a, with a state service, jurisdictional ambulance service today, so there was a certain amount of, <clears throat> um, not harden up, but there was a certain amount of, you, you, this is what you do, this is what you're going to see, and you do see all of those things, and this is how you're going to deal with it afterwards. And sometimes that's a, a really good chat with your partner, that's a good chat with someone you trust, mm. and sometimes it's simply just shelving it, like right. pushing it back. Oh, okay. Is it something that you can discuss with your partner and family, or is it something you really don't find that's... It would depend, you can do. depend on who you're working with. And I had, had partners who would look when at When I say partner, you mean your, your, your wife. Ah, yeah. you'd have to choose very carefully what sorts of things if the person sees that you're down and, um, and what you can share. Because if, what you do is when you share those things, we talked about this earlier today, when you share those experiences, you invite them into what you saw. Yeah. <clears throat> and sometimes that's appropriate uh, in certain circumstances, but sometimes it's not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, what I've learned in over 30 years, what I've learned is 
this this profession will be hard on you and it'll be it'll be wonderfully rewarding both at the same time so use the tools that will help you get through the hard part and i mean counseling and psychology and exercise as as a as a means of staying mentally well um the the critical debriefing and all that goes with it those are the tools that you have to have around you mm. if you want to have a, a fulfilling career as a paramedic i say to people i didn't know i was signing on for 30 years of which probably half of which was kind of frontline work uh i didn't know i was signing on for 30 years of it but if you were today i think the resources that are out there are so much better good than what we had so that so much better. better yeah all right so we'll, we'll jump into those in a sec but we've we've only just touched upon you're 28 you're an emt you're on prince albert island uh how long were you there for and then what happened after that? Did you move off the island and then start to, you know, give, give us give us the idea of the next step in your journey? Yeah. So when that light bulb went on that says, I want to be an EMT one, it, it started to burn brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. So as soon as I finished level one, I said, I said, and I'm working part time with Royal Ambulance Service in Summerside PEI. I had a job with the Red Cross being a safety services coordinator because that was paying the bills, like you said. I said, where's the next course I can take? And where's the next course? And where's the next course? At that time, there was nothing in the maritime provinces, the three provinces around where I lived. So I went to the US and I took EMT level two or EMT intermediate. So when was this? How long were you on Prince Albert Island before you moved off to do that? Uh, I didn't. Well, I was, I, I would go and come back. I right. would literally drive, take this training and come back. And did my EMT intermediate in 1994 <clears throat> so you start to do things like starting ivs yep uh cardiac arrest running a manual cardiac arrest uh all the medications in a cardiac arrest uh intubation and other superglottic airways and things like that so it was my mind was blown now i want you to think about it there was no real outlet for me to use those things mm. on prince Edward island when i got back right but i was still wanted more and still wanted more uh, i went back and took what was called the emt paramedic so in the U.S., there's three levels, or at that time there was three levels, EMT basic, EMT intermediate, and EMT paramedic. Remember I said that term yeah. wasn't used a lot in Canada. Yeah. And at the highest level in the U.S., you're allowed to call yourself a paramedic. So just very quickly, <coughs> you know, you keep talking about this need or desire to keep and building a bit. What was it? What what was going on here? Was it because you were learning so much about the body and that's what you loved? Yeah. Or was it because it was exciting because you had the possibility to see new things? What was it, if you can encapsulate it in, you know, a, a, a sentence, what was it that was pushing you to keep going? It was the un, it was the unexplored. And it was that that had not yet been offered in my area. And I thought, if, if I can get this training and we can get others to get this training and we can convince, in that time, the owner-operators, then we can improve the level of care and we can do things like, you know, things that we do normally now if, if, if we arrive at a patient with... Uh, a chest pain that's indicative of, you know, myocardial infarction, we give a drug called aspirin, ASA. Uh, and then think about back in 1993, that didn't exist. Mm. But yet in 1994, I learned how to give aspirin to someone having chest pain and, and you know, ST changes. So I thought, wow, I need we need to get this stuff in. We need to get this stuff in. And that's, <clears throat> interestingly enough, that's when I started hitting my first roadblocks because I was off, trained, come back, I'm ready to go. I can get aspirin, it's not very expensive. So I remember going to our medical director and saying, yeah, can we give aspirin to someone having chest pain and having some changes and things like that? Can we write a protocol about that? And uh, I would have been the first person to ask him that question. Right. And he said to me, sure, you just go find me a study where paramedics can give that drug and it's made a difference. Okay, and you, and you expect the, the next part of my story to be Sandy went to the library and found the answer mm -hmm. and came back. Well, Sandy didn't. Yeah. Because it didn't exist really so i went away and never came back all right so so <laughs> if you fast forward today and i'm a researcher and i could do all those sorts of things i had no clue i had no clue how research worked i knew i had no clue how evidence worked so was he <coughs> was he i assume he was it he so he asked you to do that yep. uh was he doing that because Business he knew way. that you weren't going to be able to find the evidence and he was just like doing it to sort of get you away and didn't want to change or did he do it because he actually wanted to know you know, show me the up-to-date evidence and we'll make the change. It's the what? latter. It was yeah. the latter? Okay. Yeah. So, yep. so it was the first time, that, and, and the short story is it does come back on and we get it on the ambulance and goes forward. But it was the first 
time in that short EMS career that I've been having that, that the word evidence came into play. So when you think back to the genesis of ambulance services and how we were, you know, kind of military in origin and Napoleonic Wars mm. and Vietnam War, which was really rapid transport. But what other things were we doing? We were doing things like putting mass pants or military anti-shock trousers on people and pumping them up and pushing blood up <clears throat> because that was a battlefield intervention. We thought it might work in the civilian side. Right. But there wasn't a lot of evidence to support it in terms out. Some drugs, like way back in ACLS in 1994 when I first took it, sodium bicarb and, and oh, yeah. uh, uh, procainamide and things like that in, in, in arrest. Again, as the evidence caught up, they're thinking, hmm, this really doesn't work as well as we thought it did. So we practiced, I use the term you know, frivolously, we practiced evidence-free. But that's not quite true. We had scant evidence, hmm. scant evidence, and... I thought I need to learn more about how to present evidence so that I can come back and I can make a case for, you know, um, lidocaine or or verapamil or, or yeah. aspirin, and uh, and it's there for the right reason. So you, a lot of the time, this evidence is probably available in the more clinical space, in the sense that in the in the hospital space or yep. working with a patient outside of the context <coughs> of paramedicine. But it's about translating that evidence to whether it's efficacious for a paramedic to be able to take the evidence that's available and incorporate it into their current um, space. Yeah, right. and and paramedics today, that we, we educate them in our universities in Australia, so good, uh, learn all about evidence early on in the, in the piece. Mm. Uh, they're presented with most state jurisdictional services or territory services with, with evidence-based protocols and, and clinical practice guidelines and drug therapy protocols. But it... 30 years ago, that didn't exist. So Before you just did what was, sorry, Matt, you just did what was anecdotally, uh, what you found to work anecdotally. You know, someone would say, oh, when I was out, I did this, it worked. And then that sort of then gets incorporated. And is it just basically, oh, we've done this, it works, we'll keep doing that yeah. without necessarily the evidence. It may, it may be uh, true, it might actually work, but they don't actually have the formal evidence to support its use. Yeah, and we never even, even thought in terms of of evidence or things like that. I was the original kind of paramedic who's, if you said research to me, my eyes glazed over. Right. Right. I had no interest in it. That's a research and still happens with do him. You find, so do you find the students today do the same? Like you have to do some convincing for them to go into that space? Uh, I challenge them and some of them will gravitate towards that space. It's so important for paramedics to be active in research. So important because otherwise mm -hmm. other people will do our research for us. But they at the university level in Australia. And 10 years ago, I moved here mm. because you train paramedics in universities. It's so good. So we, we have time to unpack. We have time to encourage that deeper understanding and most importantly, that critical self-reflection. And that's the difference. That's why, that's why you have such a great uh, paramedic education system. All right, so you are going on and off the island mm upskilling yourself, training yourself, bringing all this new knowledge back to the island. You did that for how long until you moved off to the next stage in your life? Well, I was lucky at that point to kind of, I was working part-time on the ambulance and, and uh, I got a job as a lab demonstrator at the community college that taught on the island, the EMT level one program. Where you, yeah, well, okay, absolutely, cool. as, as luck would have it. And at that time, uh, the graciousness of, of one of the ambulance operators said, Sandy, I know you want to do this uh, part-time you know, teaching, he said, I'll make sure that you have enough hours that you can live. Right. So between the two organizations, I had actually more than a full-time job. And uh, it, I really appreciated that. Like he made it easy to say, all right, I'm going to leave at that point the Red Cross and I'm going to go out on a limb. So I worked for the next six years uh, for him and that service, I should say, and other services and teaching. And it started to teach more and more and more and more and more. Is that where your passion for teaching developed? Or I not have yet? to say, yeah, Okay, it is. There were some really good people that I taught with. I was doing my, e my called my EMTP, Emergency Medical Technician Level Paramedic at the U in the U.S. I took some flight training with a gentleman by the name of Mike Nolan, who would move down to teach with me. I uh, started uh, flying part-time on a fixed wing uh, air ambulance in New Brunswick called a uh, NB Air Care. And, and it was like mind blown. So tell us a bit about that. What were you doing? Where were you going? <coughs> what types of, uh, you know, uh, Emergencies. scenes were you, yeah. What type of emergencies were you, you addressing? Yeah, so these would be uh, entirely inter-facility transports. So fixed wing means you can go from one run runway to the next. So we would do a lot of hopping around the Maritimes. This is like 1999. Yep. So just pol polar bear attacks and things like that. 
A uh, <laughs> little far south for that one, but not far off. <clears throat> so we would do everything from kind of, you know, nitroheparin drips to, to the cath lab to taking someone to London, Ontario for a double lung transplant. Right. And back again. So, are these people in the middle of nowhere? Are these reg- are these all regional, remote, or yeah, remote um, incidences? Or what? What do you address? What's the main? If someone said to you, uh, "I want you to make a guess what you're going to be seeing today on today's trip," what would be the thing that you'd be like? Oh yeah, I'll probably see this. Um, it, it was really everything from kind of you would take patients off the North Shore in New Brunswick that had that were having working chest pain and they have a nitroheparin drip and they're going to St. John for cath. Or you would, uh, we ran with a, a flight paramedic, uh, flight adult nurse, flight neonate nurse. So oh, right. a team of three. So we might have a neonate Pe- transfer. Yeah, uh, well, neonates. And wow. uh, we might be tasked to repatriate someone who was in in um, Toronto who got sick and needs to come home. Right. That sorts of things. So it could be anything from very... So no car accidents or things like that. It was more so just transport transport. from one... Yeah, so we wouldn't do scene calls. We would would land next to the closest small hospital and rendezvous there and take the patient and then off to the trauma center. Wow. Yeah, so it was was a real education. And this is the first time I'd worked in an interdisciplinary team. So you learn how to get along. And so I I flew with them kind of off and on uh, till 2001. And in 2001... It was time to let go of the yellow rope yep. and leave Prince Edward Island and go to the big city. So I mentioned Mike Nolan earlier. He was a friend of mine, and he'd moved away from PEI back to Ontario. And he said, you know, Sandy, you should come to Ontario and work. And again, that light was still burning bright. Yeah. And I was, <clears throat> we were making progress on the island, and we were, I was flying, and I was, I was having a really good time. But he said, come to Ontario. So how big is the city? How uh, big is Ontario? Uh, b- uh, as a province, there's 11 million people. It's a landmass the size of Europe. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I went to Ottawa. There was an opening with a company called Canadian Helicopters EMS. And a gentleman by the name of Steve Cameron hired me to be the base manager and fly as a paramedic in Ottawa. Wow. I so know. these are helicopters now? They are helicopters. So this is fling wing. What's that, <laughs> what's that mean? What's that mean? It just, you know, it's a, it's a vernacular for, for um, helicopter EMS. Gotcha. So it was a private company that contracted to the Ministry of Health. At that time, there was four bases, and I ran one of them. I went back to school. I was always in school. Mm. Went back to school to become a flight advanced care paramedic. Wow. And then a flight critical care paramedic. And And was this in Canada or back (coughs) back to the States to do these courses? Now I didn't have to leave Canada. Okay. I was taking all of that training in Toronto, a place called Sunnybrook and Women's Hospital. The program was called the Ontario Air Ambulance Base Hospital Program, and I was enrolled as soon as I hit Ontario. I was enrolled and stayed there really in training for probably the next two years. So the job came up for Chief Flight Paramedic. The service expanded dramatically. They picked up three more bases. So there was seven bases, and they needed kind of this one person in charge of all of the flight paramedics, and that became me. Uh, proof that I'm not really have much talent, but I interview well. <laughs> <laughs> and... So I finished my flight critical care paramedic, was chief flight paramedic, and got to fly at all the different bases. A thrill. Think about that. Toronto, London, Kenora, Thunder Bay, Sudbury, Ottawa. Think of all that, and you could pick where you wanted to work. Right. And flew with some phenomenal flight paramedics, and the, and the crew configuration was paramedic, paramedic. Okay. So, so two, so no physicians, yep. no nurses, and it was just the way they did things. Uh, and this is transport or um, emergency s- situations or all of the above? All of the above. So everything, anything yep. you can think of yep. where you need a helicopter to get in quick and fast. And is it usually urban based, urban regional? Uh, uh, urban regional. Uh, Moosney was the other place where there was a helicopter. So there was a mixture of scene calls and interfacility transports, kind of high end interfacility transports where they really needed you know, that skill set of a critical care flight paramedic. So, so compared to the, the, the fixed wing, what would have been oh. your bread and butter uh, scenario uh, for the helicopters? Uh, if you're in Ottawa and, it, and it's always kind of seasonal, but, you know, once the, we call it May 2-4 weekend, long weekend in May, hit, it became trauma season. So, right. was, so you're seeing calls went way up and it was mostly trauma, almost all trauma. And you kind of had this steady in the background, you know, hospital to ICU, ICU to ICU. So... Over a course of a year, probably 
30% scene calls, 70% inter-facility transport. Car accidents. <coughs> everything. Everything. Falls. <coughs> yep. People who said, here, hold my beer. Right. <laughs> and watch this. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And you did that for how long? Uh, four years. And so what skills did you develop on site for that? Because obviously it seems to be as you're going from one place to the next, you're not only upskilling yourself educationally through formal education, but on site practical education. So what have you learnt through the helicopters? And was that jump the most out of all the steps? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Uh, edu- the education to become a, a critical care flight paramedic was phenomenal. Mm. We were taught by high hour flight paramedics, f- emergency room physicians, staff specialists in hospitals trained by the best of the best and it took away an incredible skill set but you know what else was going on with me at that time was mm. i was i was chief flight paramedic so i was looking after the administration side of running a private helicopter air ambulance system and i and i found it was totally underwhelmed un, under uh, able to do to do those sorts of things so i said to my boss i said i want to i want to upscale and i want to do an mba Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, totally normal thing to say after well, everything that's going on. And bless them, they said yes. So I enrolled in 2005, enrolled in an MBA and did an MBA. Wow. Yeah. So I wanted to learn the business side of not only just that that particular service, because eventually that service became amalgamated and became what's now known as Orange, which is a the biggest kind of rotor wing air ambulance, one of the biggest in the world. Yeah. But and you liked the business side. <coughs> you, you actually I did. You actually thought that yep. interesting because I thought you were going to say no. You know, when I was as I was running this, you know, <laughs> behind the scenes, I had the passion for going on site and helping, you know, helping people be a paramedic, so forth. But you actually enjoyed <coughs> the business side. Yeah. So you did the MBA. Yeah. Yep. Did you use it? Oh, from the very first course I took, which was an organizational behavior course right the very first one and it was through a uh, uni called Charles Sturt University here in Australia yeah I was gonna say and I'll meet them again in yes. a few years nice. uh, loved every single course I took did it part-time took me several years um, but as as Canadian helicopters got downloaded and, and became orange um, my position really didn't exist in in uh, in that organization anymore and it didn't exist in that city so at that time I had a choice I could kind of stay within the would have been the orange system or or move <clears throat> and the opportunity to apply for the deputy chief of the Ottawa paramedic service arose almost at exactly that same time late late 2005 and you got it i did and did this require another move uh not not physically yep. but it certainly was a, a big mindset from jumping out of a helicopter to to uh being in charge of what that time it was called technical services so i was looking after the the stuff it took to run a very large, very modern paramedic service. So what do you mean by large? How many people? How many trucks? What's going on? Yeah, so th- th- you think back to 2005, it's certainly much bigger now. I think there was 500 staff, 500 frontline paramedics. There would have been, when we peaked, looking remember the, remembering the deployment plan, would peak at between I don't know, 42 to 45 trucks on the road at like 2 o'clock every afternoon. Wow. But I ran, I ran the back office, and that was the, the, the ability to put all the trucks on at the right time with the right equipment, with the right preventative maintenance, with the right equipment and supplies. Um, it, was, it was essentially a single start station, so all paramedics came to one spot. Oh, okay. Start. Although there was there was um, kind of rural rural posts as well, so we had this constant turnover, and we had to learn how to move uh, essentially a trashed truck coming off the um, their twelve hour shift, and how quickly could we restock it, replenish it, recalibrate it, and put it back on the line so that it's ready for the next one. And <coughs> how does that work? Is that something that takes? Uh, a, a lot of work yeah. or is it something that's pretty easy did you get the hang of it and go you know what this is this is too easy or was this a very taxing position now smarter people than me started the process which was doing footstep analysis and understanding all the component parts and the number of, of times things had to be had to be um, taken apart and put back together and counted and things like that um, and we used a, a software program and we did footstep analysis and we found that we could move someone move a truck through uh, clean it up completely, gross and fine decontamination, 
we would replace bags if we would have a tag system. If the tag was broken on the bag, we knew if someone had been in it, so we would take it and put a brand new one in and build those bags about overnight <clears throat> uh, to, to, to checking the stretcher and all the workers and equipment to make sure it's still in, in preventative maintenance mode, um, kind of in the 27 to 30 minute range. Wow. So that's a hell of a yeah. turnaround. Yeah, it was called Just In Time. Now, again, smarter people than me engineered and pioneered it. Uh, Urgence Santé, I think, was one of the first uh, Canadian services to do that. It's, it's becoming the norm, and it's actually catching on in Australia as well. So I got to learn that. I ran their program development and training arm, did all the kind of continuous uh, professional development for the paramedics. We had a, I ran their uh, automated external defibrillator program, all the public buildings in Ottawa had to have an AED and everybody had to have training. So we had about 500 devices placed at that time and wow. we're seeing real success. Yeah. So all of a sudden, and then, you know, had a response car and would jump calls. And so is this us. training civilians to use the AEDs on site? Yeah. yeah. So just yeah. for people listening, these are the defibrillators that you yeah. now see when you go to shopping centers and into businesses, <coughs> you might see a little sign that says defibrillator and it's stuck onto the wall. So this was something that was incorporated while you were, working at this place and you That's were right. training what was it civilians librarians and zamboni operators at the at the ice hockey rink right and, <laughs> and you know people that worked at the li- libraries and yeah. they were saving people because they were there at kind of minute zero and you know how fast um you need to get a defibrillator on to get that arrhythmia checked yeah 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 so i was learning that was so i was still responding to calls less and less and less um but i was learning the business side of an ambulance service and took on some some pretty interesting projects. We um, we initialized and built an ambulance bus. Oh wow! Yeah, so a city bus that we turned into kind of this. Uh, I think it was six beds and was deployed to deployed to mass casualty, deployed to you know building fires where there was going to be patients. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. How come we don't see that around now? Uh, here, I can't say that. I, I'm not sure. That sounds like a great idea. I mean, you're right. If uh, bring a bus in, and you can take <coughs> half a dozen people away, as opposed to one, maybe two. Yeah, well, actually, we'd treat them on scene. We'd stay. Oh wow. Yeah. So, how frequently would you need that kind of service? Where you oh, any time that there was a, a working fire, we would deploy it, even if there weren't patients. Okay. In the anticipation that there might be. Yeah. So, it, it, it as a model, it worked really well. So we had we had a lot of kind of projects like that, and we we're the nation's capital. Would you also take it to like big sporting events and so forth? Canada Day. Canada so Day. Which is there's a thing called Canada Day? Really? Yeah, like July, Australia Day. July 1st. Oh, and right. The single biggest day and busiest day for the Ottawa Paramedic Services is July 1st. Is it? It's. <coughs> what, what is it? I was going to say Independence well, Day, but it's yes, still part of the Commonwealth. It so is. It is. <laughs> so Canada what is it? Independence Day. Right. Yeah. So July 1st every year, everybody goes outside because it's summer that day. <laughs> that one day. <laughs> one day. <laughs> one day it's always. <coughs> a nice balmy yeah. 12 degrees Celsius. And there's concerts and there's fireworks and it's it's a good time. And everyone gets pissed and injuries ensue. And Sandy gets called. There's, there could be a correlation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so where are we at now? You've now... You so know I've had, I'm having a great career. So how many yeah. years were you here doing the your deputy director role? Uh, I left to come back to the East Coast, kind of to back towards my roots, 2007. Okay. Yeah, so I was in Ottawa from 01 to 07. All right, so you were there for a while. Yeah. Uh, and then and just whilst, whilst you were there in the management position, were you also looking at the looking after the educational side for your staff? Yes. So that was also coming through. Yeah. And that's so that never left. So no, you, you basically left. had your hand in education in one way or another yeah. throughout this entire process. Were yeah. you l- looking at any kind of qualification from an education standpoint? Uh, well, we, ha- we had a, a, a requisite responsibility to train our staff each year x number of hours on x number of subjects and that we would we would have a staff of uh, like a program coordinator and trainers and, and we would just be continuously in these cycles of of training but you, you spoke <coughs> about you doing an mba yep. for for the business side of things but did you ever consider doing an, an education qualification to be a better educator at that point what i had taken before that when i was at holland college was a diploma in adult learning okay management. okay yeah yeah so yeah that was that was my Check that box. So you've done a fair bit so far. Yeah, All right. Very so, busy man. Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, more qualified than you are, Matt. Uh, maybe <laughs> not, not maybe not Matt. But, uh, uh, okay, so <laughs> 2007 is where we're at. Yep. What's next? What's next for Sandy? There was a kind of this 
it was time to go home to the east coast of Canada. There was a number of things kind of personally and professionally that I said that I thought, all right, it's time to go. Uh, so we moved back to the neighboring province, to Prince Edward Island called New Brunswick. So is that still on the island? That's where I get my no. sardines. It could be. Yeah, it could be. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> It's a Canadian province, so it's beside Prince Edward Island. There's 10 Canadian provinces. So we moved to a place called Sackville, New Brunswick. Yep. <clears throat> and Sackville? Sackville. Right. So right. when you come back, there's no kind of little helicopter to work on. There's kind of no big service to work for, or for me. Uh, yeah. So I took a teaching job. Right. Was that a hard adjustment? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was a ch- big, ch- big change in gears. It wasn't, it wasn't um, a bad thing, but it was, it was what was offered and it was a good place for me to land. Yeah. Well, So training paramedics. Matt and I have known you for a couple of years. And the impression that I get of you is that you're very dynamic. You're very um, enthusiastic. You've got a lot of energy. You are an adventurer. I mean, if you were born in the 17, 1800s, I see you as the person who puts <coughs> their hand up to go into the Amazon for six weeks. to try Or a paramedic on a, on a high ship. Yeah, yeah I don't my, have bad uh, paramedics in the 1700s, but... Yeah, he, he would he would have started them. Oh, you would have been the see. You would have been the first. But my, my that's pa- how I see you. Is that am I? Is that a correct characterization of you from your perspective? Do you see yourself as that sort of person that's an adventurer? You want to go to mm. do the next thing. What's exciting? What's next? What can I do? Yeah, I, I never really stopped that that quest. In fact, I still haven't stopped it. No, like, I can really. tell. No, that's no. why I think when Matt asked when you went <clears> back, <throat> was it a, a, an adjustment in the sense that? Things weren't exciting enough for you. Is, became, that, is that what you meant? They, they became exciting. They became exciting. Yeah, so if I was in the 1700s, by now, I'd have my face on a stamp. What's mm. true? <laughs> right? Yeah, and you'd be I, over 200 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I took comfort in the fact that I, I was a really good educator. Yeah. So the opportunity was there in Moncton, New Brunswick, to come on as, as an educator at a, at a private paramedic training institution. And that lasted for a while. It was it was struggling. Uh, didn't know that at the time, but it was struggled. And at exactly the right time, uh, the the company that was running the ambulance services in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick said, "We'd like to help this institution, so we're going to buy it." And it helped them because they needed paramedics. And at that time, it it was the right time. So at this time, paramedicine uh, in Canada, at least, was not within the tertiary scope. It wasn't a university program. It really is still not. Okay. So so in Australia, it obviously is. It is. And so I know that this is a bit of a digression, but comparing this sort of private way of training people up, like the way in Canada mm-hmm. and the Australian way, for example, tertiary education, formal university qualification, what do you think is the better way of do obviously there's going to be pros and cons for each but is there do you find an approach a, a better approach one or the other yeah this one okay yes a, and is it because there's accreditation associated with it and there's you know the formal registration obviously they have to jump over certain uh hoops go, go through certain hoops i should say in order to get the accreditation it doesn't make it a better program what is it that makes it a better program it's a couple of things. Uh, all programs are accredited, even the private one I worked for. They're all accredited. They're just okay. different accrediting bodies. If you have a student over a three-year period, which is kind of the standard undergraduate degree here in Australia, you have the ability to spend a lot of time with them, to unpack a lot of the, the science of what goes into healthcare. You get a lot of time to spend perfecting their clinical skills, but you get a lot of time to spark that, I call it a deeper understanding. Right and uh, instill what I, uh, what's, what I think of as a critical skill of self-reflection. That's interesting. So it's not necessarily what they're learning content-wise. It's just that you have a greater capacity uh, to work with them more deeply in the learning process. I think so. And we have, uh, in the university setting, you have all these resources that are around you. Yeah. That we have you folks that can teach anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology, this pharma... pharma pharmacology people there's all kinds of of people that can contribute to that but it's it also gives them time to incubate mm. to understand what they're learning to let that frontal cortex grow a little bit more yeah um and mature yeah and and mature and uh, they generally school leaders <coughs> what you see at university yeah. in australia yeah they are there's some mature students but primarily school leavers very motivated 
Yeah. Uh, so it's, I, I think it's a wonderful setup. I think Canada will gravitate, it's started to gravitate in that direction where they'll have degrees as the entry level. Kind of around t- mid-90s to 2000 in Australia was that tsunami, mm-hmm. perfect storm, where it had been diploma, jurisdictional ambulance service led, kind of for the most part, and all of a sudden a university got involved and then it just had this groundswell of support from an ambulance service and and then it all started to, to work. Yeah. And now there's many universities and many programs across Australia and not only are there the undergraduate, but now you're starting to see a pathway yeah. for paramedics to say, oh, I can do a master's. Oh, mm. I can do a PhD. Uh, in the world, you know, the, in the world of paramedics that do PhDs, for instance, there's probably about 300 in the world. Well, you're one of them. <coughs> and so it's 2007. You don't do your PhD till what, 2014? Yep. So this is, what, eight odd years, seven years what's happening between 2007 and 2014 are you thinking about a phd are you going you know what i want to like what's the <coughs> plan are you happy where you are or are you still thinking forward about what the next thing is and what what was that next thing after 2007 uh it was a pretty busy period of my life so the institution i joined as an instructor got purchased i got put in charge of it it expanded greatly across not only physically but across you know canadian provinces it was successful in getting large national training contracts. We started training all the Canadian paramedics in English and French would come to our school. So I put my head down and the next thing when I lifted it, it was five years later. Right. Like there was all that had gone on. So I was a director, the director of educational services. Got a lot done. Yeah. And I'd have to say, you know, in retrospect, looking back, I would say I was looking for the next big thing. Sure. Yeah. And how much autonomy did you have? <coughs> on the curriculum that was being delivered to these students? Uh, the curriculum was the curriculum. So there's kind of a national occupational competency profile. We all based our curriculum on it. Okay. Got accredited. So that was rigid. Yeah. But but we could start to introduce things like, let's talk about research. Let's yeah. talk about career path. Let's talk about best practice trips where we take the students around to different places in the world to study. And Did you have your passion for research at this point? It was growing. Okay. And I was understanding from that first conversation with my medical director to, you know, having having practiced the most evidence-based medicine in, in Ottawa mm. uh, on the helicopter that there was possibly in being involved in research projects. I was starting to sit at the table with with folks from the Ottawa Health Research Institute and uh, Ottawa-based hospital program, and they were planning research studies, and they were saying, come sit with us. So I was starting to learn how research was done. Right, and so <coughs> was this then starting to build, hey, I think I may need to go off and do a master's or PhD. You've already got a master's in business, but research-wise, you haven't dipped your toe formally into research yet, right? That's right. So yeah. what what then happened? So you said you were there for five years. So now it's what, 2002? Uh, sorry, t- sorry, 12. 2012, yeah, yeah. my apologies, which is two years off you starting your PhD. So did you go... Okay, let's have a look at PhD programs. Or well, what was your next step? Or no. were you did you have to do an honors? Did you have to do a master's? What was what was the process for you? Yeah, so 2012, I was reaching the end kind of in my professional life. There's really I'm not sure what's next for me. Personally, I needed to make a change. And so for me it was a real estate change. Uh, a friend of mine, Joe Acker, was teaching and living in Australia. He'd been Canadian paramedic and our paths always crossed. And I found him on the internet and started con- conversing with him about research. And can we do some research with where your students and my students? And, and where was certain, he based? He was based at Charles Sturt University in Bathurst, New oh, South Wales. Back to Charles Sturt, I see. And I remember he said we, this was the link. we bring yes, this around. Yes, <clears> yes. And we started talking about projects we could do together. And, and one day he said, you know, I've got a teaching job coming up here. You should come here. He said, you can teach in the university. And there'd be a kangaroo outside your window. <laughs> and what I is said, this? 2012. 20, 2012. 2012. So instead of a moose, <laughs> I thought, all right, I can. Oh, oh. And he said, and you can do a PhD. Aha. Uh-huh. Did you even know what that was at that no, point? No idea. So just <clears throat> to take one step back, what was your motivation to want your students to do research? And what kind of research did you want them to do? I wanted them to do research that would improve the clinical outcomes of patients. And because I, it, it started with my frustration of not being able to, to seeing how it got done, to seeing that others were doing our research, our research. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I interviewed. 
I got the job. Wow. Yep. Made a big decision and emigrated January 2013. Now, you had the anniversary, 10 years. Has been and Bathurst is the same yeah. temperature as Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Joe was, it was very fortuitous. Joe and his wife, Tanya, were teaching there at that time, welcomed me. It was a, it was a really expatriate community of, of um, folks from around the world that were teaching in the paramedic program. Yeah. You said, did you do an honors? <laughs> the answer is no. Okay. Did you do a research-based master's? The answer is no. So I, I got there, started Should teaching. you be disclosing this? <laughs> Well, it's one of those, uh, I didn't read the fine print, <laughs> <coughs> nor would I have understood the fine print. Sure. So you come from a mature system where you know you do an undergrad, you know you do a research-based master's or an honors, first class standing, PhD. You did it. Yeah. I didn't know that. So I, I enrolled in a, you know, put my PhD application into a, to the school, and they and they laughed <laughs> all the way out. They, just, <laughs> they laughed hard. They said, where's your honors? And I said, what's an honors? And they said, well, where's your research-based master's? And they said, I said, well, what's that? <laughs> so they said, you're not doing a PhD in our school, fucko. You can, you can, you know, do whatever you want, but you're not doing that. Yeah. So I was quite put off. This was kind of 2013. Um, so I called up the person I was reporting to, and I said, listen, this has been a fun experiment, but I'm currently packing my suitcase, and I'm going home. So... Yeah. Uh, she was, she was aghast. She was, she is a great friend and she single-handedly kept me in Australia. So I understand now I had to observe some convention and within academia and, and understanding the pathway. So they, they created a plan for me to enter and complete to the point of endorsement an MPhil, Master of Philosophy. Very nice. And that... Upgrade. Absolutely. It worked. It. So I didn't. So just for those who don't understand, sometimes <coughs> you can <coughs> enter a master's degree, and if you do well enough in that master's degree, you can then apply to upgrade it to a yep. PhD, and then you can continue the same project under the guise of a PhD. Sometimes that project changes, but I know a number of students who have been able to do 12 months of a project as a master's, and then upgrade it and do another three or so years and get their PhD. That's exactly it. Yeah. That is exactly 100% it. I thank goodness to her. Name's Lynn Angel. And, and uh, she was. She was. <laughs> and uh, Gail Smythe was running the PhD programs at the time. And together and she they smothed worked, you. Oh, okay, sorry. They worked, they worked really <laughs> hard to keep me in it. Uh, my supervisor came on, Dr. James Wickham, and a really good supervisory team prepped me. What was your project? What were we doing? Well, at that time, it didn't end up being what I did. But I said, you know, I'm a paramedic, and the, the years were wearing at me. The years were wearing at me, and I thought there's times that I felt like really unwell as a paramedic, mentally and physically. I want to study that, and I want to see if being unwell, fatigued, uh, changes the way I make decisions as a paramedic. Do I choose this drug or that drug? So I was going. Good topic. To, mm. Oh, it was a great topic, and 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 now that light bulb, you know, blew Exploded. up again. Blew up again. Yeah. So it was going to be fatigue. I was going to do a gym intervention and see if people that were fitter made better decisions. And so that was kind of was that was part of the P, the MPhil, and, but it became a much much bigger project with the PhD, and started in twenty really started in twenty fourteen after having been in the MPhil, did my endorsement, had my team started to do my background, which was let's understand what paramedics do from a temporal flow point of view, from a energy expenditure point of view, from a physiologic point of view, and I'm not a physiologist, but I had one on my team. Mm. And uh, so I said, let's get the hexoskins. Right. And let's follow some paramedics for like six months and let's get their call data. The service, New South Wales Ambulance, was phenomenally supportive of my project. And I gathered about six months worth of data and I had my mind blown by what paramedics actually did. So tell us, what, what did you find? What we wanted to understand was... <clears throat> Uh, originally, I wanted to see how fatigued they got during the day so that when we brought them into our sim center, having before and after the gym uh, intervention, that we could give them that same level of fatiguing stuff. Yeah. Uh, and we found, what we found was completely variable, completely. So we looked at urban and rural paramedics, but what, what I ended up honing in on was there was things that was making their physiology really change. So by that means a, like a big increase in heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, self-reported fatigue. So things pushing them into a sympathetic 
place. Yeah. So things were pushing them in, and you'd expect that to be the case because, you know, a cardiac arrest call is a cardiac arrest call. Yeah. But a lot of them weren't bouncing back. So we would monitor them when they first came in, sitting quietly and establish a baseline for that shift. And we would watch them the rest of the shift, and we would import their call data, and we'd know what calls they went on and when they were there. We'd know exactly the moment they made patient contact. So we started to plot these things, and I had about 15 variables that I wanted to see. At this point, I said, hmm, what's making it change? What things are making it change? So we started cycling them in, and we built a linear mix model. I'm getting away from my gym intervention because I'm so enthralled with just the work of a paramedic. Right, it yeah. really hadn't been, I, we couldn't define it. So we found that rural paramedics, these things, you know, affected their physiology and urban paramedics was this. Gender had an influence. BMI had an influence. And yes, it is a crude tool. VO2 max had a big influence. Right. Big influence. So because it's the, a good measure of baseline fitness? From a, cardio, from a cardiorespiratory point of view, yes. Yeah. And again, not a physiologist, but, you know, I have them in my realm. So by this time, we're kind of 2015, 2016, and... We finished up by by fit testing them and seeing going back and and running their call data. So it was really the first time that that someone had a paramedic's call data in its entirety for a six month period. Like we looked at thirty two paramedics over six months that went to a thousand calls. Wow, yeah, twenty five hundred continuous hours of monitoring of which we put it all into this massive spreadsheet. All with the hexa skin. All with the hexo skin. So they, so they would chuck this shirt on at the beginning of their shift, take it off at the end of the shift, yep. and then give you the data pack and you would upload it. They would upload it. They would upload oh, well, it for you. That's yeah. good. Yeah, and yeah. then, so you've got how many hours worth of data, did you say? 2,500 2, hours. 2,500 hours of data. Yep. Looking at physiologically what's happening to a paramedic <clears> before, <throat> during, and after their shifts, knowing what they're seeing during that shifts and being able to timestamp each moment with what's happening physiologically. Yeah, we broke each call down into its five parts. Dispatch, traveling to the call, meeting the patient, traveling back to the hospital, and then afterwards when you're doing your chart. So tell did, us... Did you go beyond that to like sleep as well? We did a second sub-study of sleep uh, in the regional ones that were on call. Um, it didn't form part of my PhD. Okay. Needs to be studied though. Yeah. So at the end of it, what did you find with that? We found that there was three or four... Well, actually, more than that, there are six big predictors of a, that would change your physiology out of, its, out of its kind of normal homeostatic range and some things that would keep it out of that homeostatic range. Right, yeah. which is probably the most important thing. It's the, it the rebound into a more parasympathetic state is obviously going to be more beneficial to your health. If you maintain some sympathetic flow, mm. it's not going to be great for you long term. So what were these <clears> things? <throat> From a kind of doing the business point of view, regional paramedics – walked more in the run of a day they did far more they did more patient transports but they attended fewer calls urban paramedics were always on the move in a truck so they walked far fewer steps energy burn was lower patient contacts were more but transports were less the regional paramedics uh, exercised less had a higher bmi had a higher waist to height ratio had a lower cardiorespiratory fitness generally uh, than kind of some of their urban counterparts. And this was affecting their physiology. So we would see them. Negatively. Yeah. So if you had a paramedic in the region and a paramedic in the urban center and they both went to the same call, mm. which we can now compare, one would return to baseline a lot faster than the other one. And so, it, we, could, so who was returning to baseline faster? Those with a, with a better health status. Gotcha. A, a better baseline health status yep. in accordance with BMI, cardiorespiratory, yep. and so forth. Yep. But right. location was also a variable that hit, and um, gender was also a, a variable that hit. What didn't make any difference was whether you drove to the call or not. Um, what about, though, the difference between urban and uh, regional, <coughs> where an urban drive would be you're in heavy traffic all the time and you've got to navigate to and then back? Didn't make a difference. Didn't make a difference. No. And what was the gender difference that you identified? Uh, regional females had a higher physiologic shift than, than their counterparts. Okay. Yep. Saying it was more difficult for them to go back to a baseline yep. parasympathetic yep. resting state. But we, dr we drilled into it in the first study of the PhD, which was tell us, tell us about your health status. So we pulled the whole entire population of paramedics in New South Wales, got 850 responses. Well, that's good. And they told us a lot of things. The MOS SF36, which is like the, What's that? the um, medical outcome short form survey 36 36 questions about how you're traveling through life right 
<clears throat> well validated. It's been 5,000 studies. So we, we gave it to them. Plus we gave them a whole bunch of questions about, tell us about your exercise habits. Tell us how easy it is for you to exercise and things like that. And a strong message that we got back from, first of all, we did the BMI on them and it was higher than the population. We used the Hilda, really? Hilda data at a 2015. As in the average for paramedics was higher than the general pop. Yep. Oh, yep. interesting. And, and especially regionally. But is that also because <coughs> maybe they've got a larger muscle mass? Are they bigger, more muscular people maybe? No, no. Okay. What we found was you know, some of the links, you know, we talk about correlations and causations. The regional folks told us a couple of things. They, the shift rotation, we were on call a lot, was hard on them. That, that remains, and it's a, a big challenge to jurisdictional ambulance services to, to make that work. Yeah, but so they that, also that would go well <coughs> with other professions that do a lot of shift work too, right? They had a unique kind of um, profile sh- pro, uh, shift rotor that's not like shift work. It's actually they'd work during the day and take the ambulance home with them at night. Okay. And they'd be responsible oh. to, anyway, it's right. it's a challenge, and it's 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 continues to it's, be. It's being addressed. The um, but what they did tell us is that we can't exercise. We can't exercise because we're either on call. We can't exercise because there's no snap fitness in our in our town with one street. Mm. And they were very clear about it. Very, very clear about it. So the Would ability to play team sports, um, to yes. exercise when they wanted to, um, between the two places were quite different. Would they also report that they're just exhausted by the end of the shift and they just don't think they could have exercised even if they had that available? To Both equally said the same thing. Um, work family... Study, get in the way. Work, family, study, get in the way. Urban, rural. So it seems like <coughs> exercise, which is probably unsurprising, is a very important uh, factor when it comes to maintaining a baseline um, parasympathetic <coughs> state, particularly if you're going to be constantly exposed to stressful environments, being fit physiologically. Uh, obviously, w- we haven't spoken about the, the mental fitness or mental health associated with it, which is obviously going to be important. But the physio- the baseline physiological stress from being uh, responding to physiological stressors, I should say, exercise is important to mitigate that, to help bring it you is. back to a baseline faster, for longer, maintaining health long term. So mental health wise, obviously <coughs> you alluded to earlier uh, how taxing it can be for paramedics mm. Uh, when it comes to mental health. Uh, can we talk a little bit about that in regards to how you coped with mental your mental health um, from going to thousands of calls, including probably some pretty horrific scenes, I'm sure, um, to how you cope and how students should think about this coming into paramedicine uh, and just sort of you know go through what your thoughts are. What, what should they know? What, what probably don't they know that they probably should know? And are there any tips, hints, tricks that could possibly help them? Uh, there's, there's a number of things. <clears throat> First of all, I have a saying, and that is, I think you should be, a, if you want to be a paramedic, you should be a paramedic. And you should be a paramedic for as long as you want to be a paramedic. Okay. That's not what you, you might hear. You, see, you say to yourself, I'm going to be a paramedic, and 30 years from now, I'm going to be a paramedic. <clears throat> see how mine has changed in 30 years absolutely you should come in be prepared to do the job execute it well get satisfaction from it for as long as you want to yeah. but not less than that yeah so i think what we saw especially in my early days was this constant turnover where people would enter and exit the industry not the profession uh as a commodity <clears throat> less so now there's a big investment in paramedics as they join jurisdictional ambulance services mm. But how we prepare them as educators and how the services prepare them and how they come in with their preconceived notions needs needs to be really treated differently. And that by that I mean, if you watch a show called Ambulance Australia, great, great entertainment. It's great entertainment. It's not, and that's how I view it. It's, it's not necessarily indicative of the, the uh, temporal flow of what I studied. No. No, or or what I experienced. It's very different because they're only going to show exciting the stuff, exciting, yeah. high stress, very, pressure points. Can be very rewarding. So there's a there's a minutia to the job of jurisdictional ambulance service because there's lots of other types of paramedics out there, and it's not it's not shown to them, and the types of calls and the fact that mental health as a as a primary cause of an ambulance call paramedic call 
or intertwined in it is growing and the healthcare system is straining mightily mm. and people that are falling through the cracks are calling triple zero to have some of their health care needs met and that may not necessarily be the best way for them to be met. Yeah. So we need an education <clears throat> for those that want to be paramedics for as long as they want to be paramedics. Second is over time we'll need to have career pathways that are clear for paramedics. That, you know, if you're going to push a stretcher for 30 years, good on you. That person really is few and far between now. So what other things can they do? And how to prepare yourself from a mental health point of view. Yeah. I was not prepared. And I have seen, uh, you know, speaking earlier today, I talked about when people want to know or vicariously are interested in things that you've seen and they'll coach it that way. Yeah. To me, that starts a Rolodex in my head of, of bad scenes that I've been at and bad calls that I've done. And, and when people say, hey, Sandy, tell us the worst thing you've seen. Yeah. This is obviously something you said you hear a lot. It starts the Rolodex going. It does. Because you've seen a lot. Yeah. And it used to it used to trigger me. Yeah. And so I would not do well. Trigger you PTSD sort of wise. Like I wouldn't say I have PTSD or don't have PTSD. Yeah. I have certainly had enough experiences that I've seen things that probably m almost anyone wouldn't have seen. Yes. In circumstances. <clears throat> and I'm not even... And haven't been frontline paramedic for 30 years. I've been like half that. Yeah. So we need to get those that are coming in ready for that. Because I wasn't ready for that. So I had bad coping mechanisms. I yes. had maladaptive approaches. I was, the medical term is bent. Yeah. I was bent. And Matt's going, is that really a diagnosis? <laughs> the answer is no. However, I would drink too much. Yeah. Uh, to try and relieve whatever stressors I had. And not just professionally but personally and you know in relationships and everything yeah to be totally honest uh so it was it was kind of some total and that was it was unhealthy for me uh and i'm not saying that uh paramedics use that as a crutch but it is it's available so if we were to take the different approach which is we need to give you the mental tools and understand what mental health is and understand mental ill health and your own mental ill health and how to deal with it, <clears throat> I have to say I'm kind of there now. Mm. But um, that's the challenge where we're at right now. Yeah, and I think this is a big challenge in just um, healthcare <clears throat> broadly. So not just paramedicine, but yeah. nursing and it's medicine true. itself is that, you know, we're all trained, or doctors, nurses, paramedics, are all trained to help other people deal with their health issues. But there's not a lot of focus on self and okay. self-care uh, and and you know you can't help somebody else if you're not in a great place yourself and that can lead to this cycle of continual breakdown until you've broken down so much that it's going to be hard to repair yourself uh, and so I think you're right it's important as a you've got a 17 year old 18 year old coming into a paramedicine degree they're bright-eyed bushy-tailed they're excited because they want that excitement they want to see all of these amazing things that you know they've watched on the television and they're like, oh, i'm going to go to a car accident i'm going to go help this person and that person without thinking about the personal trauma that it might bring on how can you help prepare <coughs> a young person for this job without actually getting them to go through those experiences first up yeah. What do you do? Research. Yep. Yeah. So uh, seriously, we need to research what affects paramedics in their profession and in their personal lives. And that body of research is, is ongoing and it's phenomenal. Uh, and from there, tease out interventions, go back to the services themselves, jurisdiction ambulance services, and say, is, is what you offer, like priority one for Queensland Ambulance Service, a phenomenal program. It's their, it's their EAP service. And is it meeting the is it meeting the mark? Is it not um, for when they need that kind of reactive care? Uh, at the front end, you talked about exercise before and, and the strong role that it plays in mental health mm. as a therapy, as a <clears throat> as an intervention. So these these are sort of some of the sorts of things that we're researching now. And I do intervention work with mindfulness, tactical breathing, mindful breathing. How do they make you a little bit more parasympathetic or a little mm. more a little less sympathetically aroused? So those are things that we are teaching them. And are they r parts of reactive care or proactive care? Is there anything you can do proactively? Pro you know, you, you get the student in, it's year one of paramedicine. It's the first month and, you know, again, they're excited and without sort of bringing them down and, and getting rid of their excitement, 
Is there anything that you can do to help them prepare for what they're going to experience? Would the meditation and mindfulness and these types of practices prior to them experiencing anything, do you think that that would help? Uh, is, is exercise and mindfulness a proactive way of helping them deal with situations that they may experience down the track? Maybe there's, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not aware of what you could do proactively for this. <coughs> is there anything that can be done, do you think? Yeah, so it's, it's establishing within the university setting and as you can interact with them as much as you can interact with them outside of those settings that you understand that you're getting them to foster strong social supports because that's perfect in terms of an intervention yes uh that they can have access to to exercise that they can play team sports that they have a circle of friends so those are sorts of things that are coming out of research going on right now it's a community that friendship because relationships because they work, they work. Hu- yeah. it's, and it's it's true i mean a, 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 a huge part of health yeah. is relationships and community you it know is. we all think about don't drink don't smoke eat well sleep well yes all the, and exercise all very important things yeah. but we always neglect relationships friendships seeing speaking to people you know they're hugely important to our health and these things are coming out at the moment particularly with this pandemic of loneliness that we've sort of got at the moment where individuals are not necessarily engaging with others. You know, we've got a whole online community. Yeah, social media. Yeah. Social media, which is sort of disengaging us. We, uh, It was sold to be something that will promote community and promote engagement. But in a way, it's sort of not. And people are missing out on being with others and being around others. And that's a huge, important part of health. So, I I mean, I I totally agree with you that building a a strong community is important. Before we finish, because we've only got a couple of minutes left, because Sandy actually has to go and teach. How dare he teach these... I've got one question This next generation... Yes, sorry. What advice would you give someone who's looking (coughs) at embarking upon a career of paramedicine? Great question. Yeah, particularly general, in Australia, like um, longevity, what could facilitate their career? Yeah, but not just Australia. The general statement I would make, just to lead off, is there's never been a better time to be a paramedic. Par- to be a paramedic, never. Right? Thirty years ago, it was this. Now it's this. Mm. Um, be a paramedic for as long as you want to be a paramedic, but identify relatively early on if the trajectory you're on is meeting what needs you want for the next x number of years and by that i mean if you like running a call in running calls in downtown sydney great is five years from now do you want to be running calls in downtown sydney if not think about ancillary uh, training you'll take at the same time like a research-based masters or course-based masters or moving to um, community care paramedicine type role research teaching things like that that's number one and number two is but 30% of the paramedics in Australia are not employed by jurisdictional ambulance services. Yeah, so that was that was the reason why yeah. I said particularly in Australia is because I, I just yeah. know a lot of graduates <coughs> don't have great prospects of going into careers or work straight away. So what kind of advice could you give to someone to facilitate that transition from finishing uni- university yeah. now into a job? Yeah, some will, the thought of doing a research-based master's immediately appear, appeals to them. And they're enrolled, and I'm supervising some of them right now. I had my first student return as PhD. Oh, congratulations! So, but and here's the here's the rub. The end goal is not necessarily a jurisdictional ambulance service. The end goal might be a uh, a paramedic on a big mine site in WA. And those there's folks on the snowy mountains, or like myself, I work part time in film and television. We didn't even get into your roles in so film and television. Are, those are end points they're not just idling points yeah there's people okay. making having careers as paramedics in non-traditional settings and they're fun right they're having, i'm having a blast yeah yeah i'm having a blast so those are so think of yourself as jurisdictional is kind of over here and it's always there but all these other ones are popping up that are that are giving satisfaction and people are staying in them so help so people need to sort of have think flexibility about, in their mind yes help yeah. to navigate their path <coughs> sandy or should I say, Dr. Sandy Macquarie, uh, how can people contact you? Do you have social media? Is there any way? What, fan club. Do you have a website? How can people... Yeah, the Sandy Macquarie fan club, do which Matt's the president mug? of. No. <laughs> <laughs> how can people access you? Uh, through the university, s.macquarie at griffith.edu.au. I'm on LinkedIn. 
Uh, given name is Alexander, by the way, just in case you're wondering what, where that name's coming in from. Uh, and on Twitter, just a guy in Oz and Instagram, although I'm not really active in Instagram. Website? Uh, edgehumanperformancegroup.au. Beautiful. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. Sandy, thank you so much. We love you and we're glad that you could I spend some you. time with us. <laughs> and we'll have to get you back on the podcast. Uh, more things to talk part about. Two. Part, yes, two that. part two. Yes, part two. So, uh, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. We <laughs> That's a fan club outside. <laughs> well, there we go. Um, if you want to contact Matt and myself, you can go to our website, drmattdrmike.com.au. That's D-R-M-I... No, D-R-M-A-T-T, D-R-M-I-K-E.com.au. You can send us an email, gubiosciences at gmail.com, or you can contact us on social media at Dr. Mike Todorovich. Again, Matt doesn't have social media because he's lame. But apart from that, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, Sandy. We really appreciate Thanks, your time. Pleasure. And we'll speak to you all soon. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovich at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.